Let's return to This Week in America. Here's your host, Rick Bratton. Welcome back, everybody. Coast to Coast, This Week in America. As the Nazi threat spread across Europe, prominent English citizens establishes school for traumatized refugee Jewish children. Pupils and teachers alike showed resilience in the face of wartime deprivations facing down the suspicions of locals and, while masterminding at the same time, intricacies of the English language. The German-born administrators, themselves refugees, helped the children through loneliness and fear with a progressive-inspired education, while they graced them with kindness. The teenagers watched the orange skies, highlighted by German bombings of London 40 miles to the north, yet still ignorant of the horrors of the Holocaust and the fate of their parents. They came of age in a place open to fun and comradeship. In the process, they formed unbreakable lifelong bonds. The Holocaust and the English School by Barbara Worthington is their story. Barbara has divided her professional career as a writer-manager for a major computer company and earlier was co-founder of Tampa Preparatory School, where she taught Spanish and held the position of director of studies. She is the author of Are We There Yet?, a collection of stories about women and the issues of equality and fulfillment in the post-women's live era. She lives in a small town west of Boston, enjoys the company of her friends and family while continuing to write short stories and deal with the working women's issues. A former UN guide and New England coastal sailor, she's traveled much of the world. She holds an MA in Spanish language and literature from Brown University. And Barbara Wolfenden, author of Holocaust and the English School, is our guest on This Week in America. Hi, Barbara. Welcome to the program. Great to have you with us. Hi, Rick. Thank you. This is such a fascinating story, and I appreciate you taking time to, to come talk about it. We'll give you all the information as we go through the conversation. But give me the background on this. What was it about this school that inspired you to write The Holocaust and the English School? Uh, I had been married to my husband for a couple of years. He was uh, 10 years older than I. I knew he had uh, left Austria in 1928. Uh, no, excuse me, 38. Uh, it, uh, he was sent away for his safety to a school in England. And um, we ended up going on a cruise to Alaska with some of his buddies from that school who had come to America. Well, I had no idea what was going to happen with the stories that evolved while we're floating around the green and icy waters of Alaska, but they were hilarious, they were fun, they were tragic, and I came away from that deciding I had to write a book about it, a history book, and that was really the background. Um, I had to capture this unique history of these children who had fled Nazi Europe. And the result is the book, The Holocaust and the English School. Barbara Wolfenton is our guest on the program today. Book available at Amazon, the usual places, stratton-press.com. We'll give you that as we go through the conversation. How did you go about getting material once you decided this is really a topic I want to dig into? I want to write the book and share the story. How did you get all the material? Because you literally talked to a whole number of people, you know, the the faculty there, the students, uh, so many people and research and putting this together. Um, How did you get the material for the book? Well, there were several, perhaps several decades after the children had left the school, uh, they established a small newsletter uh, that they distributed among themselves in which they sent in stories uh, about their time in Germany, their time with the Nazis in school. Most of them came at the age of 10 years old, so I was able to um, read about pre-war Germany and the uh, the uh, discrimination against the Jews. Um, so there was one very rich source. Um, I also went to a few of their reunions, some in England, and also the London School of Economics uh, had the uh, in their archives the papers of the headmistress. Uh, before she died, she put everything into 
the London School of Economics, I was able to use that as resource. What was it like for you as you were putting this together and doing the research and the story was unfolding? You've heard some comments from your husband and his friends, but as the story is unfolding, what what was your reaction? This is just a remarkable story, isn't it? It, it was remarkable and it was a never ending story because it coincided with World War II and the Holocaust. So these are all intertwined in the experiences of these kids. Um, they, so my, I was a, one of awe and um, never ending interest. Uh, it was hard to just sort of stay on topic because there were so many strands uh, that wove into the stories of these children. As you were researching and then writing about the stories, uh, I hate to ask you for your your favorite, but talk about a memorable uh, story that that stuck with you. Maybe you you really had to stop as you were writing it and think about what they were going through at the time. What was maybe one of the more memorable stories that you write about in the book, The Holocaust and the English School? One of the students named John Obermeyer, who now lives in the United States, was one of my husband's good friends. They were a bunch of boys who kind of banded together, 10-year-olds, and they uh, lived out their uh, lives up until they were 17 in England when the war ended in 1945. So he had a particularly interesting story, came from a fairly wealthy family, in a very small town, Bad Salsuflen, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. So he arrived with his bicycle and his, you know, several packs of clothing. And um, he he went along with the, what they called the hut boys. They lived in a hut um, together when they got old enough to manage by themselves. Well, anyway, so he became my fr- my husband's very good friend even after the war. What happened to him during the war was that he did lose his parents to the Nazis. They were unable to get out. He also lost a brother who had gone to England and went had had gone back to, I believe it was Holland, thinking he was safe in perhaps 1942. Well, he perished. So so. John, or Hans, as he was called at that time, uh, had a particularly sad time. Uh, But the interest, like one of the more interesting aspects was when he left the school in 1945, he came on a troop ship back to the U.S. and ended up in the United States Army. Well, they immediately understood that he knew perfect German, and they put him back into a unit, and off he goes, and he ends up in Berlin. Um, they are still recovering from the war. Um, Berlin was d- demolished. And he told me that as a young soldier, he would ride the bus, for example, and would hear the Berliners complaining about their life. I mean, yes, they were in poverty um, and ruined, yes. but he had very mixed feelings about He couldn't really quite feel sorry for them, for what that country had done to his family and him. And these kids had lost their childhood. There's so many layers of feelings that you address in the book. The book is the Holocaust and the English School, the refuge that saved uh, young lives by Barbara Wolfenden. That's W-O-L-F. E-N-D-E-N. Book available, Amazon, the usual places, publisher, stratton-press.com, and all this on our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Uh, what did you find in, in talking to, to your husband and to some of the others, what they were going through? When did the full gravity of the situation, what was going on in the world, when did they realize what was happening? Well, I think they experienced terrible loneliness having had to leave their parents when they were 10. Yes. And that was true. There were some younger and some older children, of course, but uh, the ones that I knew the best were 10. Um, There was the Red Cross uh, that allowed uh, small little letters to go out to parents. And uh, the tragic part was that it's just hard to discuss. Um, they 
they never knew really uh, unless they kept getting parents from uh, letters from their parents whether their parents were alive where they were and so sometimes a child would stop getting letters yes. and they wouldn't talk about it nobody would talk about it but there was kind of an understanding that maybe they hadn't made it they didn't really realize the extent of the holocaust i think nobody really did until the end of the war um the book so, is, is so on emotional. The other hand, Rick, they, they uh, just real quick, they were uh, their 10 year olds going into their teens. And so during the war, they're teenagers and they're full of uh, little jokes and pranks and yes. learning about life. Yeah. You, you capture that in the book, The Holocaust and the English School, what they were going through and maybe at times mixed emotions and what they were attempting to do in the school, sort of a uh, diversion and resiliency to get through this period. And as children uh, are growing into young adults, what they were going through, the headmistress, the matron, the music, German literature and crafts teachers were, were all lesbians that you address in the book. How does this color the, the history of the school, or does it? Is it just a sidebar issue? There, there were only five, although they were the five major uh, teachers and staff. Um, the kids uh, were very naive in those days. This is true, I believe, of, of all the children, teenagers in those days uh, about sex. And um, I don't think they were... I mean, they knew there were alliances, definitely. Um, but I don't think that they were too busy looking at the other, the, the boys and the girls looking at yes. each other and growing up to really mark that. I mean, I think they, they understood, but it wasn't a, a big deal for them. Tell me about the the headmistress whose job was to pull everything together and, and keep it going and fulfill the mission of what they were doing. Talk about her. Three, she and two other of the teachers were, uh, had PhDs from, from uh, Germany. Um, she herself uh, learned uh, first at the Hamburg uh, Social Pedagogical Institute, uh, got her, her, uh, undergraduate degree and then went on to the um, I'm trying to I'm reading this because I've forgotten uh, a PhD University from of the University of Cologne um, and then she took work in social welfare uh, in Germany in Berlin uh, at the Jugendheim Charlottenburg which in those days they had um, this it was a social welfare organization very big a governmental run um, for helping women, uh, basically, uh, men too, with uh, skills. Uh, in 1929, of course, the, the crash happened. And the Germany went into depression, just as in the United States. So they were very busy helping people learn crafts that they could make some money at, such as bookbinding, um, all kinds of co cooking. There were home economic courses and so on. So they brought this this skill to the school. Uh, there was a music teacher who came a little bit later, who really was uh, imbibed the school with classical music training that the kids and the adults never never forgot. Um, um, and then there was a an English teacher who was herself a poet and a writer uh, also who who was there. Um, there was a love triangle there for a while. Yeah. Um, I think. A couple of the kids knew about it. Uh, there was some strife um, among the, the lesbian people. But anyway, Hilda Leon, I haven't even mentioned her name, was the director. A small, rotund little woman who really didn't understand children. But she had um, a brain and she knew how to surround herself with the right people. Yes. The story is so fascinating and unfolds in Barbara's book, The Holocaust and the English School, The the Refuge That Saved Young Lives. Barbara Wolfenden, that's W-O-L-F-E-N-D-E-N. -E -E book available wherever books are sold. We'll give you all that as we go through the interview. You talk about a household girl is, is talked about in the book. What is a household girl? The, bull, the, the school was actually founded in 1934, just after the racial laws 
uh, and Hitler ascended power and they passed the law that that uh, Jews could not work for the government. So many people started sending their children even before the war broke out. So the school in the beginning that had three phases. The first phase was sort of an idyllic time where even teenage girls would come. Well, they had finished their, their studies and so they needed something to do. So they started taking care of the younger children that arrived um, and the school started offering them a uh, basic training in home economic skills, which became uh, something of a, with a license that was licensed by the British government. Um, in those days, the government would not hire German refugees for any um, uh, kind of academic or um, higher level of yes. uh, work. So that's how, and so they called them household girls and they worked for free. They would, they would take classes. They did get uh, academic training, um, but they also took care of the children, uh, they helped them with the cooking, just running the school. And as, as all the children did, it was one of these very um, liberal schools, we might say in these, in the idea that the children would participate in in maintaining the school. The book is The Holocaust and the English School. Barbara Wolfenton is the author and our guest on the program. Talk before about the children and contact or lack of contact with parents. Talk a little bit about that. And maybe in the case of, of your husband, what kind of contact did he have with parents? And I'm getting for most children, uh, it wasn't a regular uh, communication stream, was it? No, no, it was not. With the war going on, um, and Jewish people either trying to flee um, or, and you know, they closed down all the uh, shipping travel uh, in 1941, I think, or the 42. So people couldn't travel. So they would escape to Spain and Argentina or China somewhere. Um, so the kids just didn't know where their parents were half the time. Uh, as I've said, uh, there was the Red Cross that allowed the children in, and I found some of these little, little handwritten notes. They would say, dear mommy, uh, I, I flew, I, I, I threw a, a ball today and, and did very, very well in my ceramics class or something. Well, the Red Cross would then transcribe those and send them out to different uh, Red, Cross, Red Cross communities in Europe. And that's how there were communications. But many of the kids couldn't, did not hear from their parents. You mentioned before, during this period, uh, you had boys, you had girls. They were young, then they were going, uh, coming of age during this period. And and mixing there. This was before the you know birth control became popular, and even sex education became popular. What kind of issues did they have? Did they have any with the, these kids? Uh, I'll call it getting in trouble during this period. <laughs> yes. The the matrons uh, and the headmistress were were terrified of anything happening. <laughs> okay. So there was really no talk of sex, no education. You know, they'd have literary classes that would talk about like the rape of the the lock, you know, uh, a, po a famous poem. And so one girl asked, "What's what does rape mean?" And and she said, "Well, well, uh, it's uh, it's not very nice." Uh, and then they'd move on, you know. Or they say, you know, what is a virgin? And she say, "Well, you know." Uh, uh, so Sophia, you're you're a virgin. She says, I am not. You know, the kids <laughs> didn't know. So there really were no unwanted pregnancies as far as I could ever find out. That's the kids did date a lot. I mean, they would sneak out of the school at night. One of the benefits was they didn't have parents just were nagging over their shoulders all the time. They kind of liked the freedom. They would run off to the, uh, they were near a big meadow. And at night they'd sneak out and perhaps smoke a cigarette, the older ones, um, hold hands, just, but there were no, there were no problems in that way. They were very naive. 
Great time is going by so quickly. Our yes, guest I'm on the sorry. program. <laughs> no, that, no, no, that's fine. I want to get uh, into this, and there's just so much to talk about, so I will recommend you pick up a copy of The Holocaust and The English School. It's a fascinating story so well told by Barbara Wolfenton, our, our guest on the program. What was it like for the children with the war going on? And at times I mentioned through uh, not that far from London, and they would see in the skies something was going on. Uh, the constant uh, news coming out of London. What was it like for the children? Was was there fear? I can imagine going through that and and trying maybe to block it out of my mind. But there are times when it would have to be overwhelming. There, there was fear and excitement at the same time. Ah, the yes. fear was that sometimes my husband would have to be a runner and send a message to a neighboring. A village is about something that was going on, and he, the kids were kind of frightened. They had the blackout, so everything was dark at night. And you know, some of them were afraid that a German would land and capture them. And of course, they were Jewish. Uh, but there was also a great excitement. They they saw uh, dog fights in the air, and the shrapnel would fall down, and they'd collect it. So they tracked the, the war also. They, they heard the BBC news every noontime on the school radio. Um, so they tracked the war and they knew what was going on. Um, so a lot of fear, a lot of excitement. Uh, they, they didn't totally understand, in my opinion. You know, they would cheer when they heard about a plane. The RAF was nearby and, and so there would be fights in the air. Um, they didn't understand that maybe when a plane went down nearby they, that some young man close to their age had died and their their teachers would remind them of that. Yeah, I'm sure that context really wasn't there. So I can see where the excitement yeah. because what you're watching is is exciting yeah. but you don't realize the consequences like uh, you mentioned a, a plane coming down. In yeah. a couple they, minutes they could identify all of the planes toward the end of the war. They knew the American planes, they could identify a German a, and a, and a British plane. They knew their make, model, and serial number practically. A couple minutes left in the program. I yes. want to talk about what happened to the school. And then I mentioned this this bond that's a lifetime bond that the students had, including, in, as you mentioned at the beginning, your husband. What happened to the school? And then talk about the bond, because this is something the, these people shared and continued, obviously, to share during their lifetimes. The school continued on until 1960, Although the kids, the original kids would leave, would have left by 1945 or six. Um, and it would take in refugees. Um, and uh, eventually, in 1960, uh, the headmistress, Hilda Leon, uh, resigned. Um, and then the buildings went became a, a home for Vietnamese, Vietnamese children. Uh, then it fell into repair disrepair, excuse me. And in 2001, a company bought the grounds. It was a beautiful mansion on a hill, absolutely gorgeous. And it converted, this company converted it into condominiums. And uh, for one of the reunions, perhaps the first one, I uh, forget, oh, in 2004, uh, there was a reunion and we, we were able to go to the school. Um, and one of the uh, the couple of the owners of the condos that had all been reconstructed and it was gorgeous. They were allowed to go into the buildings and see where they had slept, where they had uh, yes. worked, and so on. Um, so, and then the second part of your question, oh, I mentioned there didn't mention there was a farm program, but that left that was dismantled as well. What was the second part? Well, just uh, that bond that they the bond. that they have. They really shared oh. something. I mean, th this was an intimate experience they had for a number of years for some of them. And, yes. Uh, oh, yes, they did. A lifetime American, bond, yeah. obviously. Yeah, they had several reunions, some in England and some in the United States. And my husband and the people in the United States were very close together, uh, kept in touch with each other. Uh, they were brothers and sisters, I, you know, they say in times of stress that, you know, they're close quarters. They just became buddies. 
It's a remarkable story. The Holocaust and the English School, the Refuge That Saved Young Lives by Barbara Wolfenden. That's W-O-L-F-E-N-D-E-N. Book available at stratton-press.com, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, the usual places. Barbara, thank you so much for being with us to talk on the program. We didn't have nearly enough time to do it justice, but I highly recommend the book. It's such a, uh, uh, a remarkable story that you tell so well. Thank you for being with us on the program. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. The story is something that I, I wish is b- distributed because it's important history. It I appreciate really, it, Rick. It, it really is, and I'm glad that you were able to take some time to talk about the book. The book is The Holocaust and the English School, available wherever books are sold. And, of course, information on our website, thisweekinamerica.us. We're back on today's program right after these messages. This Week in America is online. You can visit our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Scott Pinkerton, associate producer of This Week in America. Jay Anderson, segment producer. Ben Watson, webmaster. Otto Bache, director of engineering and TV production. This Week in America produced and is a trademark of Blue Funk Broadcasting, LLC. For information on all of our guests and to listen to this week's show, our website again, thisweekinamerica.us. And I'm Sean Bratton, executive producer of This Week in America.